Uh, I, I, would, I would. Hey, good evening and welcome to Zoom in on a Fresh Conversation. I am Donna Gray Banks, your host, and we are here again on Monday night. Tonight, our special guest is Maisha Barnett. She's the author of From the Pain Within. Please welcome her tonight to Zoom in on a Fresh Conversation. Thank you for being here, Maisha. Thank you for having me, Ms. Donna. Ms. Barnett has graced us with her presence today to tell her story. Zoom in on a Fresh Conversation is brought to you by Eilis Diamonds, LLC, Ladero Press, Milton McCulloch, author of Love and Emancipation, a Dante production, who will feature our Keisha on May 7th, 2023 at Cinematique on Beach Street. And the Fresh Book Festival will be February 22, 23, 24 in the year of 2024 in the beautiful city of Daytona Beach. And we have our first sponsor. It is Daytona One will be our host this year for everybody coming to the Fresh Book Festival. So thank you to Daytona One for being the host hotel. If you have any questions for Maisha, please leave them in the chat room. This conversation is being recorded. Good evening, Maisha, and thank you for being on Zoom and on a fresh conversation. So before we get started with your story, tell the audience about how you decided to become a self-published author and then decide to start your own publishing company. Well, initially, um, I was disobedient. I was told to write my story um, and completely skipped over that and did two children's books. Um, I did the research and just went on Amazon KDP and just self-published them myself. Um, and then from there, uh, I was in a lot of collaboration books. And so um, that's pretty much how it got started and eventually was launching into starting a publishing company to help authors publish their stories. Now, you only published your books at first and then reached out yeah. to other authors? Yeah. Um, once I was unctioned to get into the publishing space, I had a couple friends that um, was willing to let me publish their books um, as a new publisher. So that was really exciting. Um, so do you limit your publishing to a certain genre? Not necessarily. So. Okay. If promotion is involved, I will limit it to just faith-based books. Um, but I will not turn it off right away. So if you come to me with erotica or, you know, whatever you're publishing. Children, kind of gangster or whatever, lit or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. publish them, but you won't get any promotion, promotion. Um, mm -hmm. on, on those books. Um, but you'll see them through the process for the ISBN yeah, number and, and all that. Yeah, Help yeah. them with the cover. Right, right. right. So, they get the whole process, except mm -hmm. one. So it is a full service publishing company, right? You yes. go from editing to cover design, the cover design you pretty much do yourself. And so how does all that, you know, that's a lot. When you have to send it out to an editor, it comes back and then you have to think about formatting and how long does it take you to do one book? Depending on, let's say it's 200 pages. I've lost you, Maisha. It's on the initial desire launch date for the author. So that's typically a t the timeline we go by. So let's say right now it's April and an author wants to be self-published self by August or September. So we literally work on those timelines to make sure that the author gets published on their desired date. Um, if there are any delays, you know. And what is the timeline? Six months, six to seven months? What is typically, it? Typically, typically, yeah. yeah. It could mm -hmm. be sooner, um, depending on the, um, whatever needs to be done, just depends. Pages, designing, you know, editing. Honestly, it doesn't take that long. Um, <laughs> once I have the cover and all that done you know it's really a lot of waiting on the author for the manuscript because after that the editing and formatting it really doesn't take me a long time to do so do you go through a two edit process or one typically one okay um, i've been using this editor for quite some time 
Um, and so usually when she sends back to me, uh, it comes with track changes and without track changes so that she shows, you know, what was changed in the editing process. And, you know, she, she does a great job at that. Um, so typically I don't have to do a second, you know, process of editing. That's fabulous. I think I went through two or three on my first love a long time ago, but uh, oh, so, nice. uh, the process was a long time ago. So we talked about you being every woman. You have children, you work, relationships, spiritual awareness. So when did you find tight to time to write an award-winning book with collaborative other authors? Tell me about that journey. That must have been some journey. It was your first time out, right? It was my first time uh, joining with women, joining a collaboration book. I really didn't know what to expect. I kind of was just moving on faith, to be honest. Uh, you know, that first time, it's like, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I'm Look, I'm just leaving it in your hands, and I'm just going to go with the flow. Um, so uh, that's really how that went. Um, but it turned out amazing. I got a lot of opportunities from that first book. And you said you've never been to a book sign. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, we're going to make sure that that happens in 2023. So let's talk about what you wrote about in that collaborative book. Was it about domestic violence? Was it about something? No, um, that was about my children. Okay. Um, I have four kids all together but one lives with me. And so uh, that was a small piece of that story in that book. I actually put that story in a lot of books, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of the collaboration books has been focused on putting the story of my kids out there. Why did you want to do that? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> That's just the only story that I feel I'm still trying to heal from. So okay. Continue because they're not heal. with you or? Yeah. yeah. And so it, it's still something that I deal with today. Um, <clears throat> is Has it gotten easier because of the Lord? Of course it has. But I'm still a mother. I still love my children and I still want them with me. So I do go through those motions some days. Some days are I'm you like, able to reach out and touch them? Or are they in different places? Wait, okay. Okay. Yeah, I can understand that. I only have one son and he does a lot live in Florida. And so I feel you when I, and I think I want to look him in the eye to see exactly what he's feeling, you know, and you can't yeah. do that. It's very, very difficult. So you drew up, grew up in Chester, Pennsylvania. I, I too grew up in yes. Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. And you said it was a violent neighborhood and the violence was an everyday occurrence. And in the midst of all that, you're living with your grandmother with a boyfriend. No, that no. was a different time. That was okay. Different, yeah, those were all of that was different times. So, so where did you live with? I did a lot of moving around. Okay. <laughs> so okay. Timelines, you know, won't add up unless you actually read the book. Um, but it, trust me, it's okay. a lot. <laughs> so when where were you living when the abuse with your boyfriend? I was living with my grandmother on my dad's side. In Pennsylvania? Yeah. In Sharon oh, okay. Hill, actually. You know where Sharon Hill is? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. right across the street from Happy Days. Yes. Of <laughs> <laughs> My grandma used to give me money all the time to go across the street, street. and get yeah. my um, crab sticks and my hot, my, my um, french fries with cheese and hot sauce and salt and pepper back then. Everything had to have hot sauce on it. Everything. So, yep. And I would play her numbers at that store. I always had to play the numbers. Ours was yeah. the, Mr. DeLeo's. You know, you had the little piece of paper. <laughs> yeah. and I'd say, this is from my grandmother. Or, this is from my auntie. You know, he'd know exactly what yeah. to do. But you fell in love with, a, with an abusive boyfriend. And before you got um, hurt, were there any warning signs? Was he, you know, was he a narcissistic person or did you just love the person that he was and then fell into it? I don't even think any of that mattered at that time okay at that time he was a warm body that was there for me so looking at red flags or looking at how a person is or was 
that wasn't in my vocabulary. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was younger than you. I think you told me. Yeah, he was younger than me. Right. That's younger. amazing. Uh huh. Yeah. He must have been he, good looking. Was he good looking? He, he was. <laughs> but, you know, you got to mm-hmm. think about how people grow up too. You know, that always plays a part in how somebody turns out or if they, you know, dealing with generational curses or whatever that looks like. Um, because he wasn't always like that. He was the sweet one in the bunch. Um, of his group of people. Yeah, he was of his family. He was, uh-huh, uh-huh. he was the sweet one. He was the one that you know you ain't have you ain't hear those type of stories from. Um, so it was it was very different, very different. Mm. But I think with his age, mm-hmm. mental capacity, my age, mental capacity, mixed with a whole bunch of intercourse, just kind of built the bomb. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and the first time you got hit, you said, "Ah, oh, no, he didn't lose his dag on mine." That's that first word in, but no, he didn't. So I swung back. You think you gonna hit me? And I, you ain't doing that. You're not doing that. So it was, it was a, a, a really different moment for me. I've been hurt, you know. I dealt with trauma. But I never had experienced that. I never was beat by my own mom. My parents did. Right. You know, never, right. you know, I, I wasn't that kid, you know, so it was it was very different. How many times led up to the two black guys to run across the street to the 7-Eleven and just deciding that it's over? How much did I take? Did you, yes. About a year was this worth. Wow. Up until maybe a year and a half, up until I decided to move to Georgia. Really? That was me running away. That was me running away. Actually, the year I moved to Georgia was, was 2009. So from 2007, no, 2000, into 2007, 2008, the whole year of stuff happening, I graduated June 2000. And you went to school through all this? I went to school through all of this. The man tried to throw the laptop out the window because I was, it was just crazy. So I got saved right before I went to Georgia. So that was my escape group. Mm. That was my escape group. That was me running. That's why the book is called Run From the Pain Within because I feel like I was, I was running from facing those demons they arrested him but you didn't charge right tell me why i was protecting him oh i didn't want them to put him in jail i felt like i loved him yeah i didn't know what love was i didn't know what love looked like i grew up with no guidance from my parents i wasn't raised in a two-parent household always out in the streets my mom was doing her thing I was doing my own thing you know Mm -hmm. my dad was off with his other family so you know I never got that from anybody Mm -hmm. I learned from people that I was good or bad yeah you know so you pick up on those things that you learn from other people and um you know nobody teaches you about self-love nobody teaches you about what love looks like and we talked about your grandmother being disabled <clears throat> and also your grandfather living there, but. And my uncle. And, and your uncle. That was in the house with the whole family. That was a big house. It was a two story house on that road, cross street from the happy days. And people that I thought loved me watched me go through this. I mean, I would have talks. His mom was really. I would say her rescue moments was when me and her talked by herself. I was his saying, mother. Yeah, his mom would. So would, would she got her. beat. She, she got beat yep, too. She experienced it. Too. Oh, okay. You know, um, yeah. She and what would she console you like? Oh, baby, it's going to be all right. Nope. Or would she say, "Leave"? You need to leave him alone. <clears throat> okay. You need to leave him alone. You need to 
You deserve better than this. You you got a big future ahead of you. You do not need to be here putting up with my son nonsense. Point mm. blank period. That's what she said. Mm. That's just amazing. Let's talk. That's not your first encounter with abuse. Let's talk about how it really all began and your forgiveness of people abusing you began when? Way back, right? Uh, six. Six. I wouldn't even call it forgiveness, to be honest. I didn't even know what that was. Um, I was well, forgiveness six. now. Yeah. Yeah. I would say acceptance right. at that time just accepting whatever people would throw at me whatever happened happened you know and I just kept going so initially the trauma started at six and you told not a soul not a story to tell I just that's amazing yeah that wasn't something that I felt I wanted to share I mean I didn't know I should share it you know, um, so you were abused at six and then again at 12. Okay, so you look at it from okay, two point of views. Okay, you got was it the know? same person? No, no, These okay, two different people. um, 12 year old young girl getting told that she looked like Beyonce, you know, I wear the short skirts, the high heels, got my belly showing all the time. That was me, you know, that was Sabrina in the book. Um, and older men gravitated to yeah. a young girl that was presenting herself like that. Does that give them a right? Of course not, of course not. But men groom young girls into what they want them to they feed you information absolutely yeah to tell you you this you that you Why? look this way you look that way so what you think it's gonna do it's gonna boost up some self-esteem it's gonna boost you up make you feel like you and they give you money they give you trinkets i mean you know what are, yeah. what are you what are you to do with that at 12 years old he turned out to be my cousin later on in life um, but that didn't change anything. The damage was already done. So got to read the book. Got to read. <laughs> oh yeah, the book is important you get to to get all the juicy details. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Um, oh yeah, I'm gonna again at 13 by another yeah. cousin. Yeah, that was by a different cousin. One of them. Yeah, you got to read the book. <laughs> got to read the book. That's these are all family members. These are all family members. Yeah. They. Yeah. 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 Learning later at 12 years old, him turning into a family member was different than the actual it's, family members I was around. And did anybody know that they were abusing you? You mean to your knowledge? Like adults? Yes. No. They never paid attention. Mm. Nobody paid attention. They didn't pay attention. I wasn't asked. And I didn't tell. So how has this affected your relationships going forward? It affected me in a lot of ways. You know, uh, still learning what love looks like. Uh, at this age, from a biblical standpoint, but then... You know, still not knowing what self-love is, not knowing what self-care is, not knowing what I should or shouldn't accept from a man or a boy, uh, you know. Um, so it, it did a lot of damage. And I have to take responsibility, you know, for my part in relationships because what we accept and allow is, you know, typically what we get or if you are a particular type of way you attract what you are or you know what you're doing so i believe well energy that, attracts energy I yeah, just, you yeah. Know what I, mean? I understand yeah. that the, the law of attraction right yeah i would say that and yeah what you what you attract is what you get i do understand that 
but at one point did mm-hmm. you find yourself being the abuser and thinking yeah how did that happen? and i'm sure it wasn't physical but more verbal right both it was both it turned oh. out to be both. oh so you're a fighter <laughs> <laughs> it turned out to be both um insecurities yeah uh Again, the not knowing what love looked like, and also control. Your control lot, over the person. Lot, it was a lot of control. It was okay. A lot of control there. You know, don't be coming in my house this time of night, type of situations. You ain't working. I make the rules. Oh, you, yeah. you know, or why are you with this female? Who this? Who that? You know, you lying. The insecurities, right? Yeah, it, it just turned me into a, a, a walking time bomb, a ticking time bomb. But all that was was projection. The deflection. That, yeah, deflection. That's what it was. Deflection from what the truth really is. And not so, knowing what the truth really was either. And not knowing what the truth me, really was. That doesn't mean that I believed it, right? Because I've been hurt before. You know, I don't, I don't know that telling me the truth or not right Hmm. no one of those situations where you hear a lot about uh hurt people hurt people and then um when you finally get a a a type of man that you've been looking for and you kind of messed that up a little bit uh i'm still surprised that he stayed with me to this day man won't go nowhere (laughs) but um you know our growth has really spoken for us. So my growth has really spoken for itself. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the old saying is a man will do, will move heaven and hell to be with the woman that he loves, no matter what that Yeah, is, right? I heard that before. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, you know, uh, God has graced you with somebody who loves you very much, which is wonderful. Let's talk about the church. You talk about being spiritual and and finding your ground and, and rooting yourself in the word. Where was the church through this all, this madness, Maisha? Church wasn't there. What? I was young, so I didn't necessarily seek the church um, for that anyway. You know, and I wasn't ever taught to seek the church or stuff like that. I didn't learn later um, that the church wasn't there for me until I got older, had kids, and actually needed stuff. Um, but and what was the reaction to you coming to the church and saying, "I am broken. I have children. What can you do for me?" <sighs> I don't remember the reactions of all of them, but what I will say is it left a bad taste in my mouth. Mm. Because that's the one place we're supposed to go when we're sick. That's the one place we're told to go when you need help. And when that help is not available to you, it just puts you in a bad space. It really does. How many times were you told it's your fault? And why did you do things different? That's a good question. I don't think I got enough fingers to count that. Really? I don't think I got enough fingers to count that. It was always because of something I did. It was always because of something you, you, you acting like you're doing this. So this means you're doing that type of situation. And no accountability for the men. No accountability. No. That's amazing. Nope. Nope. No. I mean, it's amazing for me to, I mean, I understand maybe my generation and my mom's generation, right? But it's amazing for me to hear that coming out of a young woman like you to say that I went to a place broken 
and you could not even get glue to be put back together. Yeah. You did I mention think, I don't think right. I stayed long enough either to even get to that point where they could possibly help with mm. anything. Um, to be honest. I moved around a lot, so I didn't necessarily stay where I would this was my church home. I didn't that okay. wasn't me. You know, that okay. wasn't you did have a, a a a woman pastor who did give you some direction at one point. And where were you at, at that time in your life? At that time, I was yeah. in my first marriage, and um, so that was a, a while ago. Yeah, I was like nineteen. Oh, listen, okay. when I first okay, so I can't tell y'all too much because volume two is based off of me initially moving to Georgia. It's okay, marriage, and stuff, so I got to be okay. careful. There. A so book. there's a part two, everybody. Part there's two. always there's there's a series coming. So right, you know, uh, stay connected for that. But um, yeah, she at one point in my life, uh, she did give me some valuable insight on some stuff that I was dealing with in that season that I needed. Mm. So yeah. Do you believe that you know? I think that sometimes even now our families are are very disconnected. Do you believe that if your family was more cohesive, um, you would have taken a different path? How important do you think family is to keeping to keeping one on a path to a better place? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be honest. I'm gonna tell you why. Because I don't regret nothing that has happened. I, God knew me before I was born in my mother's womb. He knew the family I was going to be born into. He knew what I was going to go through before I went through it, whether it was a detour decision I made to get me on a detour, whatever yeah. that looked like, you know, yeah. he already knew that that was going to be the life for Maisha. Um, Family, just because you were born to a family doesn't mean that they're a family. Yeah. You have the opportunity to recreate a new one. And I can honestly say that I've been able to recreate a new one. Um, because with all of this stuff as a child, and then as you learn from the upcoming value. As to why I no longer speak to my family, then you'll be able to understand what I just said. Yeah, family can be uh, the glue, or it can be the steam that breaks it all apart, right? And sometimes I think we are more forgiving with the mess with our families, right? So called families. Right, right. You then know. we would. Do for strangers, of course, right? And families hold secrets. You know, that, that it's, it's a lot of secrets in family that nobody do you think that's in about. Do you think that's in family, period, or the melanated family has more secrets than most? I would say the melanated family has more secrets than, than most because only our culture was told was they, what happens in this house stays in this house right? type of stuff. Um, was I told that? No, but just what I've learned over the years um, and the fact that my family has been holding on to a lot of secrets themselves. When you think about other women in the family who may have been molested or raped, you know, I'm not going to throw out. Do you all talk no. about that? Have you talked about no. that? No. No. no, no. I got a response of, yeah, but Nobody talks about the in-depth of what it could do to you, the trauma connected to it. You know, we don't have these hard conversations. I mean, I don't talk to them now anyway, so it wouldn't matter. But previously, no, those conversations were never talked about or brought up because they was molested or raped by a family member too. When you talk to young women about your situation, do you tell them to tell the story? What do. Do you what do you tell them? When I'm in clubhouse spaces or have a conversation with someone, it depends on the person. 
Because at the end of the day, I'm going to always instruct you to seek God first. Because just because you have a story, that doesn't mean that you should publish your story. A lot of times your story is meant for therapeutic purposes for your healing process. Mm. So even if you write it down as if you're writing a book, that's your therapy. That's helping you heal from that trauma. But if you get, you know, the unction to publish it, then yes, I do explain to them, you know, that you should publish your story if God told you to. Let's talk about therapy and how, why it took you so long to get some. I didn't know I needed it. <laughs> you didn't know you was crazy. Yeah, I knew I was crazy, but I didn't know I needed help. You, know, you hear stuff, right? But I didn't know I needed it as much as I know I needed it, if that makes sense. And has it helped? I know you don't have been to a lot of sessions, but do you believe it has it helped? helped? Mm -hmm. It has helped a lot. What would you say to the young girl 17, 18, that you were to the woman that you are today? Yeah, that's how I, I would tell her that just because it happened to you, it doesn't define who you are. Yeah. You are better. Then you and your circumstance. Yeah. You you are better than your circumstances. You there's greatness inside of you. You just can't see it yet. Right. But just keep pressing forward. But in the in the moments of pressing forward, make sure that you seek God to learn what true love is because He's the only man on this planet that can teach you what true love is. So how did you get there not having a real relationship with the church? Just because it's a building doesn't mean I have to understood. Go to the door. <laughs> understood. But did you I, I cultivate my own okay. personal relationship okay. with Christ? Um, because at the end of the day, we can all study together and learn together, but we can't get in those gates together. So it's up to me to grow closer to him. Mm -hmm. and play my part in whatever purpose that I have for the kingdom so that by the time I'm done here on earth, he can say, well done, my faithful, good, and servant. I mean, right. I don't want him to say that, you know, you didn't know me, so depart from me, and that's paraphrasing. Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to hear that. So it's, it's really a decision that I had to make for myself. Mm. So I would say that I, I don't know. And when people say, oh, I know how you feel. No, they don't. I mean, if you haven't been in that situation, you really can't, you can't put a stamp on it. Right. Yeah, right. No one can say to you, oh yeah, girl, I, yeah, I had a similar situation. No. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah. You, you don't understand it unless you're really in it. And I thank you for sharing that story with us. It is powerful. Um, I do want everyone to go out and get from the pain within. By Run Mai from the pain within. Run from the pain within from by Maisha Barnett. But let's talk about something uplifting to end the conversation. You have multiple streams of income. I don't know how you do it. So why do you feel it's important for a woman to have multiple streams of income? I mean, even the Bible teaches us to leave a legacy for our children's children's children, um, you know, and that's something that I want to do for mine. And honestly, it's not even about monetary for me. It's, I want to leave them my character, my resilience, mm -hmm. knowledge, and, and only God can give them wisdom, but um you know, the things that are not monetarily that can get them through those, those hard times in life is what they're really going to need. Mm -hmm. um, but multiple streams of income, it does help, right, uh, to to be able to leave them something that I never had growing up. 
And is your son involved in the company at all? Are you bringing him into that? I'm working on that? my oldest son. He got yeah. to sign his contract. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm working. I'm working on getting my oldest son. Yeah. And so finally, is there anything else you'd like to share with us about your journey? Share with us. I would like to leave some encouragement. That would be um, your pearls of wisdom. Yeah. Okay. We'll so, take it. One and this is all in reference to domestic violence. Okay. I was always in love with the movie Enough by Jennifer. Oh, J Lo. And I will watch that movie all over and over and over. And you would think that I should be triggered, right, by what has happened in that story. But for me, it was the resilience and mm. the courage to stand up for herself and her baby and to she keep going. Them. Yeah. And then to tear the man up at the end, you know, she, I mean, she had to do what she had to do. She was in a crazy situation, but a lot of women in domestic violence are in crazy situations. And there has to come a time where enough is enough. Enough is enough. And it yeah. has to be enough is enough. Because there's life on the other side. That's there's life saying. on the other side, right, of domestic violence, right? There's life on the other side just waiting for you to say enough is enough. Me and my kids deserve better or I deserve better if you don't have kids or the person that I want to become deserves better than this. Mm. Mm. There's life on the other side of domestic violence, everybody. And we have uh, Miss Barnett here to show her, her face does not tell you what her life has been. There are no scars, uh, no blemishes to tell you that um, her domestic violent life was began at a very young age and didn't end until she became an adult. So just understand that sometimes it's the journey that you have to take. We all take different journeys, right? Sometimes it's just the journey that you have to take. And thank you for sharing that journey with us today. She has a publishing company. She's a writer. She's an author. She's a mother. She has a serious relationship. And she is every woman. And thank you, Miss Barnett, for being with us this evening. Thank you for having me. This is so exciting. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. And I look forward to meeting you real soon. Yes. So when the lights go out and the cell phone towers go down, all you have left is a flashlight and a good book. We thank you for being on Zoom and on a fresh conversation. And we will talk soon. Thank you, Mike. Good night. Good night. Good night.